Some troops which had evacuated the capital had already arrived in that village. The carriages were surrounded by generals. The aide major general, Belliar, was among them. In the most afflicting details soon made Napoleon acquainted with the events which had accelerated that catastrophe. The Dukes de Treviso and Ragusa, after the unfortunate action of Fairship and Waza, had thought only of falling back upon Paris. But they had scarcely reached Ferté Gauchet when they were attacked by the Prussian Corps, which were marching by the route of Reims and Soissons. In that situation, any other troops would have been annihilated. But a passage was effected by the remains of the French army. On the morning of the 28th of March, the enemy who was in pursuit of them arrived at Meaux, and the Regency, on receiving that intelligence, felt it necessary to leave Paris. At length, the Allies beheld the walls of the capital. On the evening of the 29th, no intelligence from the armies had reached Paris for eight days. The absence of Napoleon, who was thought to be in the neighborhood of saint dizier had extinguished every hope of assistance. The departure of the Empress and her son had filled up the measure of general discouragement, and in consequence of that abrupt event, which had produced the absence of the ministers and the principal officers of the government. Every branch of the public administration was involved in embarrassment and confusion. At the sight of the enemy, the rich turned their thoughts to capitulation and the poor to resistance. The working classes had called for arms could not be supplied with them. The brave soldiers of the Duke de Treviso and Ragusa were determined, however, before they gave up the capital to the enemy, to make a last effort. A few thousand men belonging to the depots of Paris, the pupils of the Polytechnic School, and from eight to 10,000 gallant Parisians who volunteered from the National Guard marched out to take part in the action. The whole of the force employed on that occasion did not amount to 20,000 bayonets, and yet it did not despair of making head against the enemy. On the same morning, the 30th of March, the battle began at 5 o'clock. The advance guard of Prince Schwarzenberg's corps had commenced operations by an attack on the wood of Romanville. The action was maintained with great obstinacy. On that point, during the whole of the morning, the villages of Pantan and Romanville which had been taken and retaken several times, remained in possession of the French troops and the Allies had been compelled to bring up the court of reserve to sustain the engagement. But at noon, the plan of attack adopted by the Allies was ascertained. Blucher had marched by the right across the plain of Saint-Denis against Montmartre, and the columns of the Duke of Württemberg had advanced by the left upon Charon and Vincennes. From that moment, our gallant troops, surrounded on every point, and hemmed in more closely every hour, had lost all hope and fought only to die in defense of their country. Prince Joseph, the commander-in-chief of the Parisian army, observing the vast number of the enemy's troops that had arrived at the foot of Montmartre, was convinced that the capitulation could no longer be deferred. He gave the necessary powers to the Duke de Ragusa and immediately proceeded to join the government on the Loire during the interval spent in the conferences preparatory to the armistice, we had lost our most important positions. The enemy had taken possession of the heights of Mont Louis and Perlachaise. He had penetrated into Belleville and Menel Monton in the center and established himself on the eminence of Chaumont, which commands the whole of Paris. His right was collected in the vast masses about La Villette. The Duke de Raguse was driven back on the barrier of Belleville when Marcher was carried, and finally Blucher was about to attack the barrier of saint Denis when a suspension of hostilities was agreed to. It was about five o'clock in the afternoon, and a meeting between the staff officers belonging to the two armies was immediately held. The terms of a capitulation had been settled, but the articles were not completely drawn up that evening, and nothing was signed. These were the communications made to Napoleon and he dispatched the Duke de Vichesa to Paris with full powers to ascertain whether it was still possible for him to interpose in the treaty. He set off at the same time a courier to the Empress and passed the night in expectation of intelligence. During that anxious state of suspense, Napoleon was separated only by the river from the enemy's advanced posts. The Allies had forced the bridge of Sheraton from the heights of Vincennes and spread themselves over the plain of Villeneuve, saint George. The light of their bivouacs was reflected on the rising grounds of the right bank, while the corner 
the opposite bank where Napoleon was stopped with two post carriages and a few attendants was protected by the most profound obscurity. At four o'clock in the morning, a courier dispatched with the Duke de Vicenza brought intelligence that all was over. The capitulation had been signed at two o'clock after midnight and the allies were to enter Paris the same morning. Napoleon immediately ordered his carriage to turn back and alighted at Fontainebleau. It is here that we must take a view of human affairs. Let us reflect upon so many wars undertaken, so much bloodshed, so many people destroyed, so many great actions, so many triumphs, such political combinations, such constancy, such courage. What has been the issue of it all? <laughs>